Hi, I'm Mike Bellevue, and today uh, I'd like to talk to you about the revolvers used by the Confederacy during the Civil War. You know, when I started this project, I knew about the major revolvers of the Confederacy, the um, Griswold and Gunnison, Leach and Rigdon, the Lamatt, that sort of thing. But I didn't realize how many firms had um, at least attempted to make guns for the Confederacy, though most of them disappeared only after making a handful of guns. And some of those I'm going to cover, and some of them I'm not, because they disappeared sight unseen. So if you happen to have a you know a gun from your great-great-great-grandpappy made by Bogus and Bogardus or something like that that I don't mention, uh, forgive me, uh, because there are a lot of small ones they just didn't come up. I mean, some of them I can't find any proof that they ever delivered a gun to the Confederacy, let alone that it made it into combat. But I'm going to try to cover the ones that uh, you are likely to see. And some of those might be new to you, uh, as they were to me. And then, of course, you'll have all of our old favorites. All right, so in this video, I'm going to break things down into categories. And the first category is going to be pre-secession American-made revolvers, and there's really going to be one that I'm going to cover in there, and that's going to be the Colt Navy. We'll talk about that in a little bit. I'm going to talk about primary imported firearms. Now, that means basically firearms imported specifically on a Confederate States of America contract. Okay, so they were made for the Confederate States of America. They weren't just bought from every junk store in town. Uh, then I'm going to talk about primary Confederate-made revolvers. And once again, those are going to be the revolvers where the Confederate States of America actually entered into a contract with the company to supply revolvers for the war effort. And then the final category will be secondary Confederate-made revolvers. These are going to be companies that were gun companies in the Confederacy, uh, they never had an official Confederate contract, but they may have supplied guns through private purchase, that sort of thing. Uh, and they made enough guns, in most cases, that we can at least discuss them. All right, so uh, let's start off with pre-secession American-made revolvers. So the most common revolver found in Confederate service was the Colt 1851 Navy. And that should come as no surprise, because when the war broke out, the Colt 1851 Navy was the most popular full-size revolver in America. Uh, the only gun that was more popular was the Model 1849 Pocket Revolver, and quite a few of those ended up also being used in the Civil War. But uh, the unofficial official sidearm of the Confederate Army was the 1851 Colt Navy Revolver. Now, a lot of those were bought on private purchase because, as I said, there are 100,000 of those were made in the decade prior to the Civil War. And a lot of those were bought by Southern gentlemen uh, because there was an actual gun culture in the South. And many of the men who became officers in the Confederacy already owned a Colt Navy revolver when the war opened up, and they took it to war with them. In other cases, some of the Confederate states, and particularly South Carolina, because for the most part, the Confederacy was as ill-prepared for war as the North was, even though they'd been talking war, uh, or the possibility of war, for several years. But when push comes to shove, South Carolina was the only state who really actively prepared for war. South Carolina wanted to secede. And they had bought quite a number of Colt Navy revolvers um, to supply their militia, their state troops, before the war started. So they got them when it was legal to get them from Colt. But there were tons of Colt 1851 Navy revolvers in the South when the war broke out, and that was the primary Confederate sidearm of the war. Now, of course, once secession happened, uh, the Southern states lost their ability to buy Colt revolvers. Now, mind you, <clears throat> at least at that point, Colt would have gladly sold them. I mean, he was looking at a couple of locations in the South, in, in Virginia and in Georgia, to set up a, uh, a Colt depot where he could have prepositioned a lot of stock to be in position for when war broke out. 
So, say what you will about Colt, but uh, he was interested in making money. And unfortunately, secession happened, and the, then the blockade happened, before he could get those facilities set up. And when that happened, you know, the, the South was largely cut off from Colt firearms. So one of the things they did is they sent agents overseas. They sent them to Europe to buy up every gun they could find. And they bought a lot of them. And they bought all types. Uh, but we're not going to cover all those because most of the guns they bought, they bought opportunistically. Uh, in other words, the guns were available, they bought them, off they went. But in a couple of cases, they actually got specific contracts with the company to produce guns for the Confederacy. And we're going to talk about those right now. And there's really two of them that I'm going to mention. Well, we're going to start off our discussion of foreign guns with this little number, which is the Lamat, or Le Ma, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And this is definitely a foreign gun because by far the bulk of them were produced in either Liège, Belgium, Liège, Belgium, or Paris, France, uh, rather than in the good old U.S. of A. But it turns out that an American actually invented this, and the first models were made in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So let's tell the story of the Lamat. This gun was developed in 1856 by Dr. Jean Alexandre Francois Lamat of New Orleans. It was dubbed the Grape Shot Revolver because it had a 63 caliber shotgun barrel as its base pin. And that was typically loaded with buckshot and paper cartridges. And then there were nine 42 caliber chambers around that huge central pin. So it was a massive gun. And I think, I think you can see that just by my holding it. I mean, this gun is massive. It's awkward, but it is powerful. Jean Lamotte went into partnership with the U.S. Army Major P.G.T. Beauregard with the intention of having the Grape Shot Revolver adopted by the United States Army. And in fact, it did very well in trials, but um, it met with noticeable indifference from the Army in picking it up, which was a big disappointment to Lamotte and a big disappointment to Major Beauregard, who was as I'm sure you know, going to become General Beauregard under the Confederacy. So after the secession, the Confederate War Department contracted for 5,000 Lamont revolvers. Now of those 5,000, less than 3,000 were actually delivered to the Confederacy. And in addition to those for the Confederate Army, the Confederate Navy contracted for an additional 3,000. The first 100 Lamats were handmade by Philadelphia gunsmith John Kreider in 1859. And they included 25 pure prototypes, uh, experimental models. But after the war opened up, Lamat moved his production to Liège, Belgium, and Paris, France. And the European production of Lamats were plagued by a lot of problems. In fact, quite a few of them failed the Confederate government inspectors. Um, so Lamat had quite a time on his hands trying to get good guns made. It's a complicated gun, a lot of stuff going on, and uh, it's easy to mess things up. So the Confederacy had problems with Lamotts. But uh, they were a pretty big favorite with a lot of the general officers, probably because they were given to them for free. Uh, but... Uh, Braxton Bragg, Jeb Stewart, Richard Anderson, and of course PGT Beauregard himself all carried Lamotts during the war. In fact, General Beauregard's personal Lamotte is in the Museum of the Confederacy in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, and it's a, a beautiful engraved version of it and quite a fine gun. If you get out there, you'll have a chance to see it. So with about 3,000 in Army use and 3,000 in Navy use, um, the Lamats were one of the most popular foreign-made sidearms in the Confederacy. But the most popular made might surprise you because it's a gun that we really don't see very often. And, and in fact, I would love to have one of these in shooting condition, but I rarely see them come up anywhere at auction. 
and that's a Kurz Patton Revolver. Now, Kurz Patton Revolvers were five shot, 44 caliber single action revolvers produced by the London Armory Company in England. The gun's got an external side hammer, kind of like a Colt root revolver, and the base pen extracts from the rear of the frame instead of the front, as, as most of them do. Uh, so it makes cylinder removal very easy. Now, even though the curl looks like a double action, you know, British style revolver, it's not. It's purely single action. It's a five shot single action gun. The Union Army also bought Kerr's, by the way. They bought about 1,600 of them early on in the war. But the Confederates really stepped up and they basically bought the entire productive capacity of the London Armory Company in England, which is a company that made the Kerr revolver. They, they bought them out, basically, in terms of production uh, for the entire war. So about 12,000 of these Kerr revolvers were ultimately produced and shipped to the Confederacy. Now, how many made them through blockade? I couldn't tell you, but quite a few did. So the Kerr was a very popular gun among Confederate forces, and, and that's something that we just don't see reported all that much. Uh, because the Confederacy became the London Armory Company's main customer during the war, when the war ended, and of course the South was out of business, so was the London Armory Company. So uh, they, had, they had basically pinned their wagon to the Confederate States of America and um, that wagon didn't go all the way to the finish line. Well, now we're going to talk about actual Confederate-made revolvers. And once again, I'm going to break those down into two categories. There are going to be the primary revolvers. Those are the ones where the Confederate government actually entered into a contract with the company specifically to produce guns for the Confederate military. And then there are going to be the secondary ones where it was a southern manufacturer, maybe he was trying to get a contract, maybe he went out of business before he could get one, that sort of thing. But these were guns that if they made it to the Army at all, it would have been on private purchase. All right, so when it comes to primary Confederate-made handguns, all right, we've got to talk about the Griswold and Gunnison. Uh, this is the iconic Confederate made handgun. It's a copy of the 1851 Colt Navy revolver with a rounded barrel instead of an octagon barrel um, and with a brass frame. And this was the brainchild of Samuel Griswold. And Griswold was actually a Yankee. He was a transplanted Yankee. Uh, he moved to Georgia and like all good Yankees he was an entrepreneur, and he started a bunch of businesses. So he had a cotton gin factory and a bunch of other things. And uh, in 1862, with the assistance of Arvin Gunnison, a New Orleans gunsmith, Griswold converted his cotton gin factory into a revolver factory. And uh, Griswold and Gunnison were about the only firm that had a consistent output of revolvers during the war. They turned out about 100 a month. And you got to give them credit. So they are really the the primary uh, Confederate-made revolver of the Civil War. Now, unfortunately, in November of 1864, all of that came crashing to a halt uh, when federal troops overran Griswoldville. So they had a good run. They made about 3,600 Griswold and Gunnison revolvers, 36 caliber, uh, high quality and got them out to the troops. Now, besides having the rounded barrel and the brass frames, uh, genuine Griswold and Gunnison's, as, as opposed to this, you know, Pieta replica here, had a slightly back-tilted grip assembly. It kind of looks like somebody took the grip on a Colt and yanked it back a little bit and bent it, but, but they're all made like that, so it must be, must be common. And you see that in other Confederate revolvers, too. Um, not having had a chance to shoot one, I don't know if it gives you a better point ability or not. It, it may well do so. But Griswold and Gunnison, 3600 revolvers, the top of the line of Confederate made primary revolvers of the Civil War. So, next in line behind Griswold and Gunnison, 
was this gun, the Legion Rigdon. Or more specifically, the guns made by Charles Rigdon and his various partners. Because you've got Leech and Rigdon, Rigdon and Ansley. Uh, he had several, several iterations of this. So, as far as numbers go, about 1,500 Leech and Rigdon revolvers were made during the Civil War. And about another 1,000 Rigdon and Ansley. Now, just like the Griswold and Gunnison, these were copies of the 1851 Navy Colt, and they had the rounded barrel, just as the Griswold and Gunnison does. And, and people often ask me, why did Confederate guns have rounded barrels? And the answer is because rounded barrels are easier to machine and polish than octagon barrels. And I don't know why people doubt me about this, but they do. And if you've ever made you know, a rifle or anything, uh, make one with an octagon barrel, make one with a round barrel, and tell me which one's easier to polish, because it's going to be the one with the round barrel. It, it just uh, it just is. You can use buffing wheels, you can do all sorts of things on them. Uh, whereas if you've got an octagon barrel, you got to keep the planes of that barrel perfectly true and good sharp edges, and uh, and it requires a lot more careful hand polishing. So that's why they mostly went with these round barreled revolvers, because it was a little less intensive uh, on resources. But uh, Leach and Rigdon, unlike Griswold and Gunnison, did have an iron frame. They didn't have steel frames. Steel was very scarce in the South and was rarely used for gun making. So they used iron. They would use twisted iron bars and hammer forge them together. And um, that gave you a stronger product than using just one, basically, iron forging. Because by using multiple bars of iron, uh, some of which are going to be stronger and some of which are going to be weaker, but you don't have just a weak one making up your whole unit, right? So you had stronger ones and weaker pieces, and it was all kind of twisted together in there and hammer forged, and it gave you a stronger product in the end. Uh, in fact, back in the early Middle Ages, that's how most swords were made as well. Uh, so, just goes to show, what's old is new. So, Leach and Rigdon uh, started off their company in 1861 as the Memphis Novelty Works in Memphis, Tennessee, and they started off making swords. Uh, and this is another common refrain. You'll see this in some other gun manufacturers as well. But sword production got interrupted when Henry Halleck's Union forces closed in on the city uh, making Leach and Rigdon relocate to Georgia. And at that point, Charles Rigdon shifted his attention from making swords to making guns. Now, even though the Leach and Rigdon is a Colt Navy copy, it differs from the actual Navy in several particulars. Uh, first of all, there was no channel machined in the face of the recoil shield for caps to escape. The loading lever is a uh, completely different arrangement, much more like a Star Pistols loading lever. It's, it's a pin and ball detent loading latch. Uh, now, on, on December 13th, 1863, Thomas Leach left the company and Rigdon found new business partners and announced the formation of the renamed Rigdon and Ansley Company in Augusta, Georgia, and he continued to manufacture revolvers. So, Leach and Rigdon's revolvers used a standard six-stop uh, cylinder. And that's what we're used to with revolvers. You can see it right here. It's got one stop per chamber. When they went to uh, Ridgeton and Ainsley, they developed a gun with a 12-stop cylinder. And the purpose of a 12-stop cylinder is to provide safety notches so that you can lower the hammer in between two nipples on the shoulder of, of a chamber. So instead of having safety pins that a, a notch in the hammer had to engage, uh, instead they had a, a separate bolt stop that locked it up halfway between chambers. Now that worked okay on these guns because they were 36 caliber. Uh, Colt tried it when they went to their um, 1872 
Richards Mason conversion in 44 caliber and they deemed it to be dangerous for that because they were putting more bolt stops into the thinnest parts of the cylinder and they just did not feel that was a good way to go so they dropped it. So that was the second most popular gun made by the Confederacy for the Confederacy. Now the third gun on our list is uh, one that's actually a little bit different. The Spiller and Burr. And this was based on the Whitney revolver, which, which of course uh, Remington copied many of the features of the Whitney revolver for their new model Remington. Uh, so this Whitney Spiller and Burr will resemble a Remington in several ways, including the, the solid top frame. Um, but it's a 36 caliber, smaller than a Remington. This differs from a Whitney because it is made with a brass frame. And, and once again, the reason for brass frames is because they couldn't get steel, and iron, and steel for that matter, are harder on machine tools. So the machine tools lasted longer if they were cutting brass than if they were cutting iron or steel. And machine tools last longer, means they have production longer. So Spiller and Burr made uh, 1,450 revolvers for the Confederacy, putting them into a solid third place and putting them head and shoulders above the guy that's going to come next on the list. Okay, so these are the big three in terms of revolvers made by the Confederacy and used by the Confederacy. Everything else is really marginal. So if you were doing, say, an impression, reenacting impression, any of these guns you could get away with, though to be honest with you, a Colt Navy revolver would probably be the way to go. But you could definitely still get away with one of these. I mean, 1,400 of them went, went to the troops. Uh, and that's not going to be the case on the other guns that we're talking about. Thomas Kofer of Portsmouth, Virginia, started the Augusta Machine Works in Augusta, Georgia in 1861. And his goal was to make handguns for the Confederacy. Now, the gun that Kofer designed was essentially a very well-made copy of Colt's Navy revolver in 36 caliber. And in fact, this was an exact copy of the Colt. Had an iron frame, had an octagon barrel. Uh, it was very nice. But like a lot of companies, Kofer just could not get off the ground. And only about 100 of these revolvers were ever produced. Now, most of them have conventional six-stop cylinders. But there are some that are known to have 12-stop cylinders, and as you can imagine, they bring quite a premium on the collector's market. So the next gun I want to talk about is one that I don't have a copy of because very few people have a copy of this. It's the Columbus Firearms Manufacturing Company's revolver. This is a company that was founded in Columbus, Georgia by Lewis and Elias Heyman in 1862. And the Heymans were also originally sword manufacturers. This is you know, kind of a common thread. Uh, when they entered the handgun business, the Heymans were quickly awarded a contract by the Confederate uh, Board of Ordnance for 10,000 revolvers. These would be uh, copies of the Colt Navy revolver, as, as we, uh, we've seen so many times. And as on most Confederate Navy revolvers, the guns made by the Columbus Firearms Manufacturing Company had the rounded barrel, not the octagonal barrel. Now, these guys actually have kind of an interesting tale to tell because the Confederate government advanced them $50,000 against the contract for 10,000 guns, basically to get them started in business. The unfortunate thing is, they only delivered a hundred of those guns. Not quite the 10,000 the Confederacy needed. Uh, and I don't know what happened to the $50,000. I suspect that was in the air. Uh, because that's the way things work in government. Well, the final gun on our list is uh, one that you've probably never seen and never heard of. And very few of them made it to the Confederacy. And in fact, I, mean, I used four or five different sources for pulling this together. And several of the sources said that this company never got a contract. 
Uh, and then I found one source that said they did, and, and it gave me a pretty specific citation on that. So I believe they probably did get one. But these are guns made by T.W. Kofer. And uh, he was a, a Virginia-based gunsmith. And the gun that he sold the Confederacy was based on the Whitney revolver, so kind of like the Spiller and Burr, except it was a spur-trigger gun. And he was actually a very innovative gunsmith. So he had three models of this gun. And one of them used brass cartridges, reloadable brass cartridges, that you fitted with a percussion cap. And it had a special back, kind of like the R&D cylinder backs. Uh, except that back allowed the hammer to strike that percussion cap that was mounted on that cartridge. Uh, it was pretty cool stuff, I have to say. As Kofer had very little formal education, uh, but he had one of the first patents ever issued by the Confederacy. So there you go. I mean, the guy was uh, was pretty amazing, right? So from what I can determine, the government actually did place an order for 82 of these revolvers, and Kofer filled that order, and the guns were delivered on May in May of 1862. And all the guns were delivered to the 5th Virginia Cavalry. So I believe that Kofer actually did deliver guns. So this, this makes this a primary uh, Confederate martial handgun. But as I said, it's a very odd gun. And very, very few of them were ever made. So if you run across one, you've got something quite rare. So that wraps up the primary Confederate Marshall revolvers. Now we're going to get into the secondary guns. And these were guns that were made by Southern companies, uh, but they did not get contracts from the Confederacy for them. So the most popular gun, by popular, the most manufactured gun, of Confederate made revolvers uh, is this baby which is the Danson Brothers revolver, which is quite distinctive because it has no recoil shield. But this gun is basically a uh, pared-down Colt Dragoon. They were made in 44 and 36 caliber. And I'm going to be honest with you, this gun balances way better than a Dragoon. It's, it's more like a long-cylinder Colt Army revolver than it is like a Dragoon. But it... Uh, but it has very much dragoon type styling with the barrel, the grips. It's a very comfortable, excellent revolver to shoot. James Henry Dance and his brothers began manufacturing these revolvers in 1862. And they made them in Texas. Uh, they made about 500 of these, of which 350, the, the bulk of them, were in 44 caliber and the balance were in 36 caliber. Uh, and just, just as a, a point of interest, the Apache Chief Geronimo was carrying one of these when he surrendered to the U.S. Cavalry in the 1880s. So they made it around. And I'm going to tell you, at 500, and we don't even know if it's 500, 500 is the maximum of these that were produced. It could have been as low as 350, and they could all have been in 44 caliber, or almost all have been in 44 caliber. We, we know there are at least a few 36 calibers around. Uh, but besides these guns, there are also what I'll call also rands. And, and those were three other companies. I'm just going to mention them briefly. I'm not going to go into a lot about them. The Snyder and Glassic, they only manufactured 50 revolvers. And, and they're the big winner by far, okay? But they did not have a government contractor. George Todd was another minor manufacturer, and he made seven revolvers. And Tucker and Sherrard only made two revolvers. Now, their claim to fame is 400 of their revolvers were assembled from parts after the war was over. But during the war years, they produced two, only two. And, and that is pretty much the entire hit parade for Confederate revolver manufacturers. So the biggest manufacturer, of course, was Colt. 
And after him were the British Kurs. Those would have been the two most common revolvers used by the Confederacy. And then you get into the Lamatts and the Griswold and Gunnisons and the Leech and Rigdons and the Spiller and Burrs. Uh, and after that, it just drops right off of the table. So that's our look at uh, Revolvers of the Confederacy. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you do, give it a big thumbs up. You know, that helps us mess with the algorithm. Because as I've told you in some of my updates, I can tell by looking at the, at the numbers that uh, the videos that have been coming out have been fairly popular. Uh, there's a, a metric called the click-through impressions rate, which says out of how many times, what's the percentage of times when YouTube shows somebody the video, shows them a thumbnail, and that person opens it up. All right, so my rate's pretty good. And on some of them lately, it's been double or triple normal, and yet I've been having less views, which means that YouTube is not presenting them with that thumbnail to click on. Uh, probably because it's gun stuff. But if you do the thumbs up, you can mess mess with their algorithm, and maybe we can get more eyeballs uh, in front of these things. So we'll see. So anyway, that's it. And until next week, bye.